Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our virtual panel celebrating the upcoming launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. My name is Ann Brown, and I'm the director at the Walworth Daily Public Library in Walworth, New York. Um, tonight is a special program that we're hosting, but we also offer a wide variety of virtual and in-person programming um, for people of all ages. So if you don't already, please follow our Facebook page or check us out um, on our website at walworthlibrary.org for more information on those. Um, we ask that all audience members remain on mute and keep your video off so that everyone can enjoy this presentation. Um, we'll, we will be posting the recording to our YouTube channel in the coming weeks. And I want to thank everyone who submitted a question during the registration process. Um, we tried to incorporate as many of those into the presentation as we could, but there are all, if we have time, there will also be a question and answer session um, at the end of the program. So feel free to type your questions into the chat box um, as you think of them, and then we'll get to those at the end. Um, the James Webb Space Telescope is the largest and most powerful science telescope ever constructed. Its revolutionary technology will study every phase of cosmic history in our own solar system, as well as the origins of the very first stars and galaxies. Webb's enormous size and frigid operating temperatures presented extraordinary engineering challenges that required international collaboration of thousands of engineers and scientists all over the world in order to make Webb a reality. The Walworth Seeley Public Library was very excited to be selected by NASA as a community partner to host this pre-launch event. We are one of almost 500 host sites, including other libraries, museums, science centers, and planetariums. Um, NASA has also provided us with some commemorative items to give away to participants. Um, so I'll give you some more information about those at the end. Um, in addition to partnering with NASA for this event, we are also very lucky to have expert panelists from L3 Harris Technologies um, in Rochester, New York, which is one of the companies that help work on components of the telescope. So today we have Tony, Scott, and Conrad, um, who all are from the Rochester area. And I thought that hosting this panel would be a great way for our community um, to learn about the contributions to science and engineering that are happening right in our own backyard. Um, so I'll let each of them introduce themselves and talk a little bit more about their role on this project. Thank you, Ann. Uh, I was the lead systems engineer for figuring out how we were going to integrate and uh, test this telescope. And then as we became closer to the test, um, I switched roles to become the cryogenic optical test director for testing this telescope. And I'll pass it on to Conrad. Hi, I'm Conrad Wells. I'm an optical engineer at L3 Harris. Um, I started on the program uh, trying to figure out how we were going to put the telescope together and figure out uh, how to measure where the mirrors go. And then I uh, joined the team that eventually came to Houston to test the telescope and make sure that it worked right um, at 40 degrees above absolute zero. It was a, a wonderful 17 years on the program. I really enjoyed it. Scott? Uh, yes, my name is Scott Kennard. I started the uh, my efforts on the program doing the mechanical design for the sport support equipment for the cryo test at Johnson Space Center. Uh, I worked on the center curvature optical assembly that Conrad will talk about in a little bit. Uh, I also worked on the massive uh, support structure that supported the telescope while we were at our you know, 32 Kelvin uh, test temperatures. I then uh, migrated from doing the uh, support equipment design and fabrication support into doing the flight optics uh, assembly and integration, where I worked doing the alignment activities uh, with a team of metrology engineers and assembly techs aligning the 18 primary mirror segments, the secondary mirror segment, and the aft optics segment at Goddard Space Flight Center, continuing on through supporting the instrument integration as well. Okay, thank you, Scott. Um, I will start off 
Uh, hopefully you can see my screen. I'll start off giving you a, a short introduction to L3 Harris uh, for those who may not be familiar with the name. Uh, so L3 Harris uh, is a large organization um, with four main divisions. Two of those divisions have a large presence here in Rochester. Um, you see second from the left, left is the space and airborne systems. That's the division that the three of us are in. That's the division that uh, was a big part of the James Webb Space Telescope uh, and other telescopes for NASA. Um, uh, the next one over is the communication systems. Uh, that's another division that's here in Rochester. Uh, they make uh, radios for first responders and military and uh, other customers. Um, and then lastly on the right is the aviation systems. Uh, they do things like uh, they're a big part of revamping all the uh, airport traffic control systems around the country to allow higher density uh, flights going in and out of airports. Okay. For some reason it's not uh, advancing for me. There we go. Uh, so L3 Harris has over 350 locations uh, around the world in 100 different countries. There's uh, on the order of 48,000 employees. Um, I think it's still stuck, um, not in oh. presentation mode. Yeah, so you're back or you're not sharing the right screen. Back up again. You see a full screen though, right? Uh, we see the PowerPoint screen with the slides small yeah. and the other slides on the left side. Uh, Four mission aligned segments. See if that works. Oh, okay. Sorry about this. Space and airborne systems we see, Tony. There we go, perfect. Okay, great. All right, so we have 350 locations around 30 countries around the world with uh, 48,000 employees. Um, so going through the, just our division, the space and airborne systems, you see a large percentage of us are, are space. Uh, you know, we're a large division, $4.9 billion. Uh, we also get into electronic warfare, avionics, and Intel and um, cybersecurity. And this is communication systems. The other uh, division that's in Rochester, uh, this includes tactical communications, public safety, as I mentioned, integrated vision systems and broadband communications. Uh, if you wanna see other things that we do, you can go to l3harris.com and I will point out that uh, you can find in there a, a neat video about the Roman Space Telescope, which is the NASA telescope that we're working on now here in Rochester. So I will switch over to the James Webb telescope. There we go. So hopefully you see this. Perfect. So uh, the web, the James Webb Space Telescope has four science themes. These are the four missions that the telescope was designed for. The first one is the most mind-boggling one. 
Um, the, the telescope was designed to see light from the beginning of our universe, the very first light in our universe. Um, and to understand how that works, <clears throat> uh, you have to understand that uh, the velocity or speed of light is 186,000 miles per second. So if you think about the moon, the moon is about 200,000 miles away. So when you're looking at the moon, you're actually seeing what the moon looked like one second ago, because it took a second for the light that reaches your eye um, to, to come from the moon. Uh, the sun is 90 million miles away. It takes eight minutes for the light to come from the sun. So when you see the sun over the horizon, you're looking at the sun as it appeared eight minutes ago. And then if you take that out further to the uh, closest bright star, which is four light years away, meaning it takes four years for light to travel from that star to Earth, um, you're seeing that star as it looked four years ago. So now extrapolate that all the way out to the edge of the visible universe, which is what the Webb Space Telescope is designed to see. And it takes that light about 13.7 billion years to reach the telescope or your eye. However, the, because we're so far away from that light, there's so few uh, light rays per area that uh, your eye doesn't see stars that dim. Uh, you need something as sensitive as the Webb telescope. The Webb is designed to be 10 to 100 times uh, more sensitive than the Hubble, depending on where you are in the spectrum. The Webb is also designed to see the assembly of galaxies. So soon after the first light, uh, galaxies started to form. Um, also the birth of stars and, and planets, um, both at the beginning of, of the universe and, and closer in to uh, today's universe. And also uh, has the ability to measure the spectrum going through the atmospheres of planets to look for signs of life on planets outside of our solar system. So one way to get to that sensitivity is to have a much larger primary mirror. The primary mirror is like the pupil in your eye. Uh, during, during the daytime, your eye is very small. So um, it lets in less light in um, because, because the um, environment is so bright. Um, but at night, your pupils in the dark, when you're trying to see in the dark, your pupils get larger to allow more light in. You can think of the example of uh, when you're driving, you see um, uh, somebody has their bright headlights on far away, and you're anticipating them to switch to the dim lights before they come to you because far away, there's less light rays um, entering into the pupils of your eye. Uh, so it's it's not as bright, but you know, as it gets closer, more and more light rays get inside the pupil of your eye. So now, Matt, so your pupil at night is, you know, about four to about a quarter inch diameter. Uh, so imagine stretching the pupil of your eye to about 20 feet in diameter, which is the size of the of the primary mirror of the web. So that gives us a much bigger chance to catch light rays from that light that's 13.7 billion years away. So that's, that's one reason why it's designed differently than the Hubble to see light from that far away. So as Ann mentioned, the launch for the Webb telescope is scheduled for December 22nd. And a lot of people ask us, you know, are you gonna be excited when, when the launch occurs? And so uh, one of the things we'll tell you is that uh, the rocket launching this telescope out into space is just one thing that happen, has to happen correctly. Uh, there's about 100 deployments that also have to work to allow this rocket to unfold in space. Um, and th that's about a two week process. So yes, the first day we're excited that the launch is successful but we keep our fingers crossed for another two weeks 
for the telescope to unfold. And then uh, once it's unfolded, we have to wait another month for the detectors to, to get cold enough to get first light to allow us to align all the mirrors. And then it's another three months for the detectors to get cold enough and get calibrated to be able to take our quality science images at the end uh, in order to know how good the telescope is performing. So why do we fold up the telescope like this? Um, you know, the Hubble was not folded. That was launched in the shuttle. Uh, that had a single primary mirror um, that fit inside the shuttle, so we didn't have to unfold it in space. But since this one is so much bigger, it's bigger than any of the rockets available today. Uh, so that's why we have to fold it up and then unfold it out into space. It is going up on one of the most reliable rockets available today. The rocket it, it travels on is uh, over has over a 99% success rate. So to give you an idea how uh, large this is, this is a uh, mechanical model that we built up in the parking lot of the Rochester Science Museum. So you can see the size of the people there and those who have been to the museum have an idea how big the parking lot is there. So that gives you an idea of how big this, uh, this telescope is. Um, so <clears throat> the Webb telescope is actually designed for near infrared light more so than visible. Uh, Hubble was more, more, well, it was ideally designed for the visible light, but also reached down into the ultraviolet and up into the near infrared. Infrared is a longer wavelength, longer than red light, um, longer wavelength than visible light. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, the first being that uh, infrared can penetrate through dust and dust clouds are a location in our universe where uh, planets and stars are formed. So uh, with the web, uh, the infrared light can penetrate through that dust into the telescope. The picture on the left is what it looks like uh, with the Hubble telescope. And the picture on the right is uh, what it's expected to look like using the Webb telescope. Another reason for infrared, um, there's uh, what's called the Doppler effect. Um, most of you may know about the Doppler shift based on acoustic waves. Uh, if you have a sound coming towards you, it will be at a certain pitch. And then as soon as it passes you and moves away from you, that, that pitch will shift to a lower pitch as it goes away. Uh, the same thing happens in light. If something is moving towards you, it shifts more towards the shorter wavelengths. If it's moving away from you, it shifts more to the longer wavelengths. So one of the things that we learned from Hubble is that the universe is not only accelerating, or not, not only expanding, but also accelerating, which means the further you look out into space, the faster those stars and galaxies are moving away from us. So the light that we see at the edge of the universe uh, gets Doppler shifted. The visible light from the edge of the universe gets Doppler shifted all the way into the infrared by the time it get, reaches uh, the Webb telescope. And why is that important? Uh, because one of the things we want to do is to look at the atmospheres of starlight going, or sorry, look at the, look at the uh, spectrum of starlight going through the atmospheres of other planets and look for signs of light. Different molecules in those atmospheres absorb different parts of the spectrum of the light. So we look for those spectrum patterns in the light. Um, and look for things like oxygen, ozone, methane, carbon dioxide. And um, just in the, as you can see to the lower right, uh, as you look farther and farther away in the universe, that spectrum that we're looking for shifts further and further to the longer wavelength. So that's why we want infrared to measure that spectrum. Now, uh, heat also emits infrared. 
And here's an example on the right where uh, this person's arm can be seen with an inf infrared camera right through that plastic uh, bag, you know, just like uh, it can all, it also passes right through dust, um, just like that plastic bag. So um, for us engineers building a telescope, there's one challenge to that in that um, the telescope has to be cold. If the telescope is warm, even at room temperature, it would emit its own infrared light and completely swamp the infrared light coming from the universe. So uh, in order to prevent that from happening, the this telescope was designed to operate at 400 degrees Fahrenheit below zero, colder than uh, the freezing point of nitrogen and oxygen, which presented us some challenges, which uh, we'll get into later. Uh, so this is an exploded view of the telescope. And L3 Harris's responsibility was uh, essentially putting most of these parts together um, and testing this telescope down in the chamber. Scott will talk more about putting these parts together and uh, Conrad will talk more about testing. Here's a picture of <clears throat> the instruments that go on the backside. So let me go back to that slide um, one more time. So this is the instrument module down to the lower right. This tucks into this uh, square pocket in this back plane underneath this uh, radiator assembly, which is about the size of a minivan. So this is a picture of that instrument module. Uh, now this module was made both in the US, Canada, and Europe. Uh, we have in the upper left, the mid-infrared instrument, which goes all the way out to the 30 micron wavelength. It's an imager, a spectrometer, and a chronograph. Uh, that was built in Europe. Uh, in the center is the near-infrared camera. Uh, that's a high-resolution imaging camera with uh, spectroscopy and a, and a coronagraph. And I'll, I'll, um, I should explain what a coronagraph is. So uh, chronograph is an, is a, an instrument that blocks uh, the bright sun so that you can see a uh, dimmer planet or other object around it. It's sort of like sticking your, your thumb uh, over the sun when you look up in the sky so you're not blinded by the sun when you're trying to look at an airplane or something near it. Um, so that's what a chronograph is. That's, that's what gives us the ability to seek out those atmospheres and those planets. In the back is a near-infrared slitless um, spectrograph and a fine guidance sensor. Um, that spectrograph is, is a design that's uh, ideal for brighter images. Um, and the fine guidance ses sensor is what gives the web telescope capability to lock onto a certain uh, direction to capture long exposures of, of uh, the universe. In the lower right is the near-infrared spectrograph. This is a two-dimensional micro shutter array uh, and slits. Uh, it can take the spectrum of 100 objects simultaneously. And in the lower right uh, is a picture of uh, two of the detectors. Uh, all of these instruments, I think there's something like 14 detectors in here. But you can see that these detectors are much larger than um, what's in your cell phone, for example. Uh, they're also not made of something easy to make like silicon. They're made of a different material that is much harder to make. Um, and actually, when this project started, we did not have tech detectors like that. University of Rochester was one of the big helpers in uh, doing the research and development to enable the possibility of making those detectors. So we'll get into assembling the mirrors. That was one of our um, responsibilities uh, at L3 Harris. Uh, we 
designed and built. A lot of the equipment that you see here, most of the people that you see here are also uh, Rochester crews that went down to Maryland to put all of this together. And uh, we were also responsible for a placement of the ISOM, uh, the instrument module in there. Uh, as Ann was talking to, talking about earlier, over a thousand engineers were involved in this. This is a map of all the various locations with companies that uh, were involved in the Webb Telescope project. Here's a close up of our area. And you can see quite a few in the Rochester area uh, that we worked with on this project. I can think of twice as many uh, companies as these, but um, you know, I think this was over a certain um, cost threshold uh, on the project, but there were many more than even what's in this map on this map. And I know we have a lot of people on the call who helped work on this through various companies, not just L3 Harris. So feel free to drop that in the chat if you helped work on any part of web. Um, because the telescope was so large, <clears throat> there were only a few uh, air places in the whole country that was big enough to uh, do a test. Uh, so uh, we ended up picking um, NASA's largest operating chamber at the time, which was used back uh, in the 60s to test the Apollo lunar module. Um, so we've refurbished this chamber to uh, test an optical mission and uh, also inserted a refrigerated helium shroud to get our temperatures down to 400 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. And you can see a picture to the right. One of our early tests with the chamber, uh, we had a, a tiny air leak um, and you can see where that air uh, froze onto pipes. The one on the left is solid nitrogen. The one on the right is solid oxygen. This chamber is uh, 120 feet tall by 65 feet in diameter. We needed something that size in order to test this telescope and also get a, a super cold helium shroud in there. And it's interesting uh, so to think that in that middle the, picture, Tony, right? In that middle picture, there's an astronaut sitting inside that uh, that lunar lander or lunar uh, orbiter uh, during a, a a test inside the chamber. In inside a vacuum chamber, there's a man sitting inside that while they're doing these simulations back in the 1960s. Yeah, and this module would rotate around on its floor. This uh, Apparatus to the right was a simulation of the sun. They wanted to simulate the radiation of the sun on the lunar module as it was orbiting. Um, and um, so that was, that was why it was basically a rotisserie in front of the sun simulator. So just a quick intro on the testing. This is a picture on the left of the telescope uh, rolling into the chamber. Um, and a cartoon in the middle of some of the equipment inside. Um, as Scott mentioned, there was a lot of equipment that lifted up over the, over the telescope for this test. There's also um, a lot of equipment, um, a lot of electrical uh, racks outside of the chamber supporting all of this equipment. Uh, most of the equipment inside this chamber was designed and uh, built through L3 Harris. And, uh, and other companies that helped us. Uh, you can see uh, the cocoa that Conrad will talk about at the top. You can see three flat mirrors. Uh, you can see cameras on windmills spinning, spinning around on the walls. Um, and you can see picture to the left in the back. Uh, there was a lot of simulators to simulate the sun shield and spacecraft thermally during this test. So I think I'll stop there and hand it over to, uh, I guess we'll go to Scott next to talk about. Okay, no, that, 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 that's perfect. In fact, Tony, if you don't mind, leave, leave, it, on the, uh, leave it on the chart that you have here, because I'll, I'll start with this one with a few background pieces that I had working on the design of it. 
So in that middle image, one of the details that we have not highlighted so far is the entire optical test that we were performing in the cryo chamber. Um, in order to be able to perform the optical measurements, because of the sensitivity to all of the equipment, to vibrations, the entire system was suspended from the top of the chamber. So those six, I'll call it, boxes that you see on the top of the chamber in that image, those are isolators. And those isolators suspended everything from down below it, including the cocoa, the autocollimating flats, and then the entire telescope on the you know support structure that's underneath it. So that entire structure that you see rolling in the chamber in the left image, we actually suspended that in the chamber in the middle image, and that is how we were able to isolate it such that the uh, the entire system could be uh, kept from the vibrations that would cause uh, issues with the optical measurements that Conrad and the uh, test team down in Johnson were performing. Uh, so, <clears throat> as Tony said, a lot of the details that we had to work were new things specific to this type of testing. Those massive structures that we were suspended there, those are all weldments that needed to be rated to minus, minus 400 and something degrees. I, I apologize. I like working in Kelvin. So the, uh, the, the massive weldments were rated to go down to 20 Kelvin. Um, so that was breaking a lot of new, you know, technological uh, advancements there of developing welding techniques, developing our structures, understanding what was happening at those cold temperatures, you know, from contractions, you know, all, all good engineering stuff of, you know, thermal conduction, uh, you know, we were concerned about, you know, <clears throat> the different impacts for our electrical harnesses that were going through there. So there were a lot of very interesting things that we got to work on as we were designing this hardware specific to supporting this test down in Houston. Uh, continuing on to, I believe Tony's going to show me a video now of the mirror integration at Goddard Space Flight Center. Okay, so the video that uh, you're going to be seeing played, this is of the, uh, the telescope composite structure down at Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Uh, and the, this is actual time-lapse photography of the integration team performing the primary mirror segment installation and alignment. So each of the mirror segments, and there's 18 primary mirror segments, each of these mirror segments was installed and aligned to, you know, approximately 100 microns, you know, as we were going through and doing this. We were using laser trackers with, uh, you know, as our method of measuring the alignment. We were placing these. You had to go through a, a series of steps to do your initial alignment, and then you would do the fine-tuning of the alignment. You see the robotic arm that's going across. That was our primary mirror installation fixture. That is what we used to lift the mirrors into place to align them. That also allowed us to, once we got them aligned, it supported the activities we were doing to secure the mirrors to the, uh, the composite backplane structure. One of the unique tasks for doing this alignment was working through you have this mirror that was designed, or the, the entire telescope with these 18 primary mirror segments that was designed for use in a zero-G environment. The problem that we ran into is we were actually installing it and measuring our alignment in a 1G environment, such that the weight of the mirrors was actually causing the gravity sag of the mirrors. So we had to work through the analysis to support 
what each of the mirror locations needed to be in a 1G environment, such that when we were in a 0G on orbit and environment, we were meeting our alignment requirements. So that was really, really cool engineering to work through. It was a really good team to work with between the assembly techs, the metrology engineers, all the supporting team members from both uh, L3 Harris as well as the partner organizations that were uh, supporting the effort of doing the primary mirror segment integration. The same effort was continued on for the secondary mirror and then the aft optics uh, system, which was a, uh, that houses the uh, tertiary mirror and the fast steering mirror, which is the segment, or I shouldn't say the segment, it's the uh, almost a, uh, a box or, you know, rhombus looking thing that comes out of the center of the primary mirror segment. Once we finish this uh, loop of the Make video, I believe the Tony has the Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so let me share back to the So this is the aft optic subsystem in the center. Yep. And this is yeah, the secondary so we, we, mirror to the left. Yeah, go ahead. So the, the same team that supported the, uh, the primary mirror segment installation, we also supported the secondary mirror installation and alignment. That's that image on the lower left. Note that the secondary mirror uh, support structure is in its stowed orientation as we were performing this integration activity. So that was, uh, it added some of the challenges to designing the hardware that was required to support the integration. Um, some of the other things that you can see in the images, specifically the one in the lower left, is not only do we have to design the hardware to support the actual uh, uh, mirror segments or the, the, you know, the, the telescope hardware that we're installing, we also had to manage to get personnel in the right locations such that uh, they had access with their hands and whatnot to get to where they needed. But in many cases, we also had to keep, you know, move the people that are moving around, we had to keep that isolated from the actual hardware because just the act of a person walking across some of those platforms would create enough vibrations that, was, that would cause issues with trying to measure the alignment and some of the uh, installation activities. The image on the lower right, as Tony said, that's the one, that's the uh, the red panels that you see there. Those are actually protective covers for the uh, radiators that are on the uh, outer surfaces of the uh, aft optic system there. So that aft optic system, as I said, houses the, uh, the tertiary mirror and the fast steering mirror. And then the image in the upper right is one of my most favorite images from working on the James Webb Space Telescope integration effort. What you're seeing in that image is you're seeing two L3 Harris assembly techs going through and doing the manual removal of the protective mirror covers that we were using during the mirror integration. And why it's my favorite image is for the, you know, at the point in time we were doing this for the $6 billion, and I know that number has gone up since the mirror integration, for the $6 billion that had been invested into the telescope at that point in time, one of the biggest challenges we had was how are we going to remove these mirror covers in a most fail-safe means and through different trial and errors and mocking up different strategies and whatnot, it still came down to qualified techs with steady hands. And that is what we use to be able to uh, remove those. What you can't quite see in that image is they have two diving boards that are sticking out over the top of the uh, mirrors, the primary mirror surface. And then the techs reach down while they're lying down on those diving boards and they lift up the covers by hand to securely, uh, you know, take them out to a safe distance and then they get retracted back. But yeah, that is one of my most favorite images there. And then I believe Tony has one more video to show for the, uh, the integrated science instrument module getting integrated into the, uh, 
composite structure of the uh, telescope. And as he's keying that up, so the other half of uh, the effort that we were supporting from the, uh, the flight hardware integration was we did the, you know, installation of the, the mirror segments and the optical system. We also did the uh, integrated uh, science instrument module or ISOM as it was uh, known. And uh, this video shows that that's ISOM right there in the center. And then it'll go through and it'll get lifted up and it'll get lowered down into the structure. The planning to do this effort was, you know, years in the making. You know, even when we had everything finalized down and we knew exactly what we wanted to do, uh, it, it still took a lot of time to work it through. We did trials with some, uh, you know, simulation hardware such that we, you know, could control the crane, we control the lift fixture, working through the different activities that needed to be done. There was a very discreet steps that had to be followed as far as the uh, flight structure goes to be able to lower it into position. And then as we lowered it into position, it had to be offloaded to a specific uh, loads. We couldn't put a full load into the system as we were uh, securing the uh, hardware that you know, kept the ISOM aligned to the uh, the telescope. So for all the alignments that we're talking about, you know, you know, the entire optical system all the way through needed to be aligned to these very very tight tolerances. You know, at this level here, we're we're talking like tens to you know less than a hundred microns of what we were looking for to be able to meet the alignment requirement. And oh yes, that that is an alignment requirement at the zero G state. So we had to accurately predict what the gravity sag of the system was for this particular configuration as we were installing it at this point in time. Yeah. So Scott, uh, just for reference, 100 microns is uh, is the width of a thick human hair. Yeah, so it's a hundred yeah. microns. It's a tenth of a millimeter. It's yeah, the width of a human hair. It's for those of you who like uh, uh, inches. It's approximately four thousand. No, four thousand. Yeah, four thousand of an inch. Yeah. And I think at this All point, right. looks I'm, like the video I'm stopping there. Over. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm good. I think I can turn it over to Conrad now and he can start talking uh, the test stuff. Yeah. And you had some real, I mean, placing that instrument package through that hole in the structure, you had very small clearances too, right? Oh, um, it, it was to get that yeah, in. It, it was. was very yeah, I mean, small clearances. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was very small clearances. And one of the things that the photos and the video don't quite show is we actually had to take apart the back of the structure. There are some struts and the removable cross member that are on the back of the structure that we had to actually remove those to be able to insert the uh, insurance module into it. And then we had to reinstall the struts and the uh, the cross member before the you know you can you can see the struts and the cross member in the in the image in the center there that you see those gray diagonal struts on the back side of where the uh, the ISOM gets installed. Those had to be removed, and we couldn't allow the full weight of the science instrument module to be carried by the back plane or by the, the, the composite structure until we put the composite structure all back together. So that was a, let's right. put it this way. It was a very long day when we were doing that. <laughs> yeah. Lots of training. I and mean, that's one of the things that I think you learn um, in going through a, a program and an integration that is as challenging as this is that um, it all comes down to planning and practice and patience, right? Planning, practice, and patience. And it's it's really impressive. That's exactly the slide I wanted you to be on. Um, 
that's what I have to tell you, the, the, the technicians that work at L3 Harris um, practice, they have patience and they do their job amazingly well, right? People, I'm an engineer. Um, engineers don't really touch the hardware, right? Um, in, in some cases, we're not allowed to touch, you know, we're really not allowed to touch it, right? It's the people who are, are trained to use their hands, right? In a controlled fashion, right? And I've, I've gone through the apprentice, you know, I've been an apprentice to learn, um, you know, to not break things, right? Um, how many times are, are we working in our garage or working on a car or something and, oh God, I shouldn't have torqued that that hard or things like that. Well, you can't do that on a, on a $14 billion telescope, right? You've got to have, you know, the patience. And, and another thing you need to do is you need to make sure that the telescope is put together correctly and that it works properly. Right. So Scott just talked about how he put the telescope together correctly. Right. They torque the bolts properly. Right. They make sure the fit of everything is is correctly done. Right. I mean, these these mirrors were half a um, or five millimeters separated from each other. Right. And they were being placed in there to about, you know, each one to each other to about an accuracy or at least a knowledge maybe of 100 microns. The actual. Um, requirements were were more like half a millimeter, but we typically, uh, but we did it to an accuracy of 100 microns. We knew where every mirror was on that telescope, literally to a human hair. Um, and that was done with some amazing measurement equipment, something he mentioned it a couple times, a, a laser tracker. And it's, it's basically a, a laser that measures the time of flight, okay? You send a pulse of light out to a cube, and it's it's what you see when you see uh, people surveying on the side of the road, right? And they've got these cubes up there, and they shine a laser into these cubes, and they can tell how far away things are. And the ones that they're using for surveying are maybe good to a millimeter or 10 millimeters, right? A fraction of an inch. Um, the ones that we use to put this telescope together are made by the same company, a company called Leica in Germany. And the ones we used were good to about, you know, uh, 25 or 50 microns, a fraction of a human hair. Um, so, you know, Scott and his team, they spent a lot of hours. You know, the other thing that, that a program, a large international program like this, is that um, you have to travel a lot, right? So that team was traveling down to Goddard an awful lot, put in a lot of hours in hotel rooms and, and really did a great job. Similarly, right? Um, we had to go to, to Houston, Texas um, and work in this, you know, amazing facility, amazingly old facility as well, right? I mean, the building was built in the 1960s. It had, you know, an old elevator, but you knew as I put into the chat window that, you know, we were walking on the same floors that John Glenn was walking on, right? All the astronauts that um, have been onto the space station, have been, there's a chamber just across the way from this one that is smaller, that is still man rated. And they put people inside that chamber in their spacesuits to test the spacesuits and to test the tools that they use. Um, for example, to repair the Hubble, they were testing the tools that they use inside there. So a chamber that looks just like this. Um, this chamber here is one of the largest, it's I think probably the second largest chamber in the United States. And we retrofitted it to, as Scott mentioned, to operate, um, I think, as low as possibly 12 Kelvin at a helium refrigeration system that um, um, had a three quarters of a megawatt compressor. Um, and it recycled the helium in a refrigeration loop um, to cool the chamber, to cool those walls to uh, during the test to about 20 Kelvin. Um, so this telescope, when it goes to space, it has that sun shield, right? That's the size of a tennis court. And why does it have that? It has that to keep the telescope cold, right? Because as Tony mentioned, the heat from the telescope itself would, would blind it from the light that it's trying to see from 14 billion years ago, 13.7. Um, so we put it inside this chamber and brought it down to 40 degrees Kelvin. Now, each of these mirrors, right, these mirrors were built by Ball Aerospace in Colorado, um, and they were tested at um, NASA um, Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. Each of the mirrors was tested by itself, and it was, it was verified to be of a certain quality, um, which met all the mirrors met specification. Um, each mirror had seven actuators. Each mirror can move um, 
to align to the mirror next to it. So our job in this particular test was to take these 18 mirrors, right, that had all been tested individually and to test them as a whole mirror, right, to make sure that um, these mirrors worked properly with each other and that we could uh, phase them to each other. Um, and so how do you measure, how do you do that? Well, we designed something called the center curvature optical assembly, um, which is what sits up at the top of this chamber. And it has another, it's again, a laser, right? And it shines laser light down on these 18 mirrors and measures um, the position of each mirror with respect to each other, right? And we're gonna show, why don't we show, I'm gonna show a video that, oh, good, here we go. So this shows the, um, the, the interferometer um, the center curvature optical assembly, and it has to live inside the chamber, right? So it had um, an interferometer inside a pressure tight enclosure, the PPE there, and it had an actuation system built by a company in, in uh, a company called Moog, which actually has some uh, divisions in Buffalo. Uh, they were made in, in San Diego, um, but it had an actuation system that could position this um, to accuracies of, of submicron. It could, it could do uh, accuracies to a hundredth of a human hair, move around as it aligned itself to the, mirror, to the telescope and shine light down on the telescope and looked at, at the reflection. Um, so, and that was uh, one of the first things that we started working on. We probably, I, I started working with um, John Hannon and on that in like 2004, taking the concepts that, that a bunch of people uh, developed during the proposal to turn it into what it became. And um, probably, you know, 100 people at, 50 people probably in, at Harris and Rochester, L3 Harris, formerly Kodak, uh, formerly ITT, formerly Excellus, right? All those companies are now L3 Harris. Um, uh, worked on. And so if we show the, the video here, we'll show you what it looked like. And in the upper right there is the, um, is the, uh, a picture of the NFR, of this COCO system up in the top of the chamber. So you can, this is what's called the fifth level. It's five floors up in the, up in the sky or up in the chamber at the very top. Um, and you can see the air ducts. Another thing that we, this chamber had to do was keep the telescope clean while it was in there. It was in there for weeks while we were finalizing the assemblies, right? And so you can't allow the telescope to get dirty in that case. So while the door is open, it's a clean room inside that chamber. Then you close the door and you pump out all the air and about um, a few days later, it's at vacuum and about 30 days later, it took about 30 days. I think maybe you have that, that plot, Tony, in, in this chart set, um, or maybe you don't. Um, it takes about 30 days, um, actually the next, yeah, the next slide. Um, it takes about 30 days to get cold, right? So um, this shows um, previous, yep. Um, so you see here, you know, we started on day zero. We, we did some testing at, at that vacuum and then we started the cool down. We turned on the helium compressors and started the cool down. Um, and this is a picture of the telescope inside the chamber. Um, uh, I'll take a little detour here and say, you know, just when we got cold, what happened? Well, uh, Hurricane Harvey happened, right? So we got 50 inches of rain in five days during the middle of testing a, a $14 billion telescope, right? And thankfully we didn't lose power. If we had lost power, that would have been a real challenge, um, but it was challenging enough for the people just to get, the people who were working to get food um, was, was a real challenge. Um, Tony may, may talk about that um, in, his, in his wrap up. But um, so um, if we go to the video, we'll show you what the, center curvature in a interferometer looks like um, when we were building it at uh, Micro Instruments in Rochester, New York. Um, they helped us um, put it together. And what you're gonna see is, um, you'll see some of, you'll see the hardware, uh, you'll see Mark Connolly uh, prominently sitting there aligning a mirror. Um, so this is gonna show, um, about a month before we shipped it down to Houston, um, the 
center curvature optical assembly with a, a surrogate primary mirror where we were testing it. So here you see these large pressure tight enclosures that are holding the actuators. We've got some optical beam splitters and assemblies that underneath it. Um, and what we do is that gets raised to the top. So if we stop here, Tony, right? So now we have this interferometer on the top of the chamber and we're looking at the, the surface of the primary mirror. We are able to measure the surface of that primary mirror to the accuracy of about 10 nanometers. And Tony told me today that that's about how much your nails grow uh, between the morning and lunch, right? So your, your nails grow about one nanometer an hour, I guess. Um, but putting it another way, um, if you pretended that we were measuring, and it basically you get a to topographic map, you measure the high spots and the low spots in this mirror. And if you took that mirror and you made it the size of the entire United States, right, and you were measuring the topography of the United States, we would be able to measure the measure the height of the Rocky Mountains or the flatness of the plains to an accuracy of a quarter, right? So over that 3,500 miles, right, we would measure the accuracy of the topography to a quarter. Um, so let's see, the rest of the video, um, um, so, um, that shows shows uh, the rest of of the cocoa. There's there. the inside some, yeah, some. Actually, that's kind of interesting. You know, the we they had to design a, a special interferometer um, in order to do this type of measurement. And a, a company in in Arizona um, designed a very special interferometer that was was paid for by NASA um, to be able to do this sort of measurement. Nobody had really, that is, you know, the thing of when you're designing one of these great designing, building and testing a, a NASA great observatory is you're doing things that haven't been done before. And that's what makes it fun, right? I mean, I, I spent 17 years on one project, but I tell you what, it was, I mean, there were hard times and there was hard work, but I loved it. And it was a great, you know, it's it's the crowning of, of my career. Um, I think for for all of us, we, we as Tony said, we can't wait for two weeks to go by after launch and know that it opened up successfully. Um, and then know 30 days later that everything looks good. Um, so that's, um, that's, that's what I had to say today. Um, and I know we probably have some times for, uh, hopefully have some time left over for questions. So thank you so so much, Tony Scott and Conrad, for sharing all that information and those really cool videos with us. Um, I know we're running a little bit over on time, so before we do the Q and A, um, I just want to show everybody the items that we got from NASA that you guys can come to the library and pick up. Um, so we have um, some stickers, bookmarks, uh, these eight and a half by 11 lithographs that have an image of web um, and some facts on the back, um, some pocket folders, uh, little children's activity books with different space and web themed um, activities. And then we also did get some full size posters um, that say unfold the universe and have an image of the telescope. So if anybody's interested in picking up any of those items, um, you can email me um, at Walworth Library Director at owlowwl.org. I can drop it in the chat um, and we can set some aside for you. They do have to be picked up in person. Unfortunately, we can't mail them if you're not in the area, um, but we will have those available for pickup. Um, and... We'll also be sending out um, a little survey to all the participants. Um, so we would really appreciate your feedback to help the library and NASA continue to plan these kind of community events um, and collaborations. And there will be a question on there if you wanna request some items, you can request them on there as well. Um, so I know we had a few questions that were submitted um, ahead of time that we didn't get to. So one of the ones that got asked the most was when is the public gonna be able to see the images that Webb takes for us? 
Yeah, so as I mentioned, it'll take two weeks to go through all the deployments. Uh, a month after that is when we get first light. So now you're talking six weeks out. Um, I don't know if they'll show first light images or not. Um, then it takes uh, about three more months to cool down to get the true science images. So you're looking at five to six months out to get the uh, fancy science images. I, I don't know of any plans from NASA to send out intermediate images or a first light. Okay, great. Um, somebody else wanted to know how the telescope will be controlled after the launch. I don't know, if, Conrad. Do you want to take a turn, or I well, can explain? Say, it. Yeah, sh sure. Um, well, it's um. So the uh, the people who will be operating the telescope is the um, SCSTI Space um, um, Space Telescope Science Inst Science. Uh, help me, Tony. <laughs> at at, <laughs> at Johns Hopkins Space University. Telescope so Science Institute. Nurse. Thank you. Space Telescope Science Institute. Um, they actually operate the Hubble as well. So all images from the Hubble get get being, you know, go through uh, a uh, communication system and, and come through um, the Space Telescope Science Institute. And they are in charge of the operation for uh, JWST as well. Um, and the team that is commissioning the telescope, um, right, there's a launch team that's at the launch site probably. And, and there's a NASA control room, I know somewhere, uh, but I believe the um, the initial commissioning of the telescope takes place uh, with a team that works 24 hours a day at the Space Telescope Science Institute starting uh, sometime in January, about a month after launch. Okay. And where um, are they going to point it? Well, there was an interesting article, and in, in, I don't know, for those of you who went to the University of Rochester, um, uh, John, uh, uh, Professor Feenup had a comment, you know, they said, well, how is the first image going to look? I saw somebody asked about the first image. Well, the first image is going to look horrible. <laughs> and that's, I mean, unlike the Hubble, where it did, there was a problem with the Hubble Space Telescope, and they had to repair it. Uh, but this telescope will look horrible at first, because it takes about three months to phase the mirrors and get them all aligned to each other using a technology called wavefront sensing and control. And the University of Rochester was instrumental in uh, with some of their graduate students in developing the software um, that's going to be used to uh, align the telescope uh, to, to starlight. Any um, other we had, questions? We had several people ask um, what the big picture goal is for Webb, what NASA hopes to learn through these images. I know we talked a little bit about um, planets being born and you know how stars are formed and that sort of thing, but can you t just talk a little bit about kind of the big picture hope for this project? Well, you know, a lot well, those, of people say, I would say those... we didn't know, go ahead. Uh, I, was, I was going to add what you're about to say, Conrad. So those those four missions that I talked to, to are the main purposes. Um, obviously, if signs of life are shown on another planet, that would be exciting news. Um, but uh, there's also a lot we don't know, and this is a brand new fancy tool we're putting up into space. So we're gonna see things that we never even thought to ask. Uh, from this telescope. Same thing happened with Hubble. Um, we learned about um, a lot about dark matter and dark energy with Hubble, for example, among a lot, lot of other surprises. Um, Is there so, anything that, that you panelists are particularly excited about personally? Well, that's what I'm excited about. See what we don't know today, but uh, I'll let Conrad and Scott answer. Yeah, I have to admit, you know, it. It. What I know about astrophysics is what I learned on this program, really. Right. I. I. You know, people say, ask me about, you know, what I know about astrophysics, and I don't know very much. But what, you know, the lucky the presentations, the, 
the JWST science um, manager um, was a Nobel Prize winner, right? And so I've seen him talk a number of times and and it's always amazing to to see him and and but yeah i think i think the nirvana would be that they're actually able to look at starlight that goes through a planet and that they see the absorption spectra of of carbon dioxide or oxygen or something or or methane or you know something that uh can only be created by complex organisms you know not uh and through a life cycle. There's a, there's a lot of um, things we don't know about the early universe. A lot of the physics doesn't make sense when you extrapolate backwards. Uh, so there's a lot to learn on how the universe uh, formed. Um, so that will also be exciting to learn about. Scott, did you have anything to add? Uh, so I'm going to be the mechanical engineering geek on this call and say the parts that I'm going to be most excited about for this program is when all of the mechanical deployments are successful and, you know, when, when, when it, you know, cools down properly and it's working properly. And I get to hear from, you know, the, the, the optics people and the astronomers and all the scientists that are collecting everything to say that it really works well. That is what I'm most excited about. I mean, yeah, the the astrophysics stuff of it, the the research that is really really cool. But I'm going to be the uh, I, I'm the mechanical geek, and I want to know that that all the hard work we did, all the engineering we did, it it worked. That's what I want. That's what I'm excited to hear. Very cool. Yeah, one of the uh, NASA scientists in a training that I did said they couldn't wait to see the images that it's going to collect and also all of the new Galaxy print products that are going to be made out of them, like t-shirts and all of that. So I thought that was a fun thing to look forward to that I wouldn't have thought of with this launch. Um, and then there was a question in the chat earlier um, asking if you knew how heavy each individual mirror was, I think of the 18 that were on there? Um, yeah, so I'm going to go by memory here. And the problem is uh, I, there, it's approximately 95. And I can't remember off the top of my head if that is pounds or if that is kilograms. I believe it's kilograms. So I'm pretty sure each of the, uh, each of the uh, primary mirror segments weighed approximately uh, 95 kilograms but I may have my units off and it might be pounds and I'm only going by memory. My apologies. No problem. Um, and just a general question um, real quick. How, how did each of you get interested in the aerospace industry? And do you have any advice for other people who might be interested in entering this kind of career? Well, I ended up, let's see, I, I went to the University of Rochester and I didn't know what I was going to do uh, when when I got there and I discovered optics and uh, I, I I love it. It's a it it you it's something that seems to be something that you can you can think about, you can, you know, because we use our eyes every day. It's it's understandable. The, an image is something that that makes sense to me. Um and I ended up, you know, that that particular uh um, career leads very much into, you know, high, high technology fields that often are aerospace related. I, I worked in the semiconductor industry uh, before coming to uh, L3 Harris. And when I had the opportunity to, to join a team here, uh, I, I took it. I actually got into so, aerospace by accident. Oops. Go ahead, Scott. Oh, no, no, go ahead. You can finish, Tony, then I'll go. I actually got into aerospace by accident. Uh, so I also went to University of Rochester. Uh, and when I graduated, uh, I graduated from grad school at University of Rochester. Um, my, my girlfriend was going to grad school down in Maryland and had one more year. So I, I 
I just went down there and I said, don't worry, I'll find a job somewhere. And, uh, and uh, I ended up finding a job at NASA working on a telescope. So that's how I accidentally got into the business. Uh, and she became so, uh, my, my wife. So it was worth the trip. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my story is not all that far from Tony's, but slightly different. So uh, I, I, I graduated uh, as a mechanical engineer from Worcester Polytechnic Institute in uh, Worcester, Mass. Uh, I actually ended up in the automotive field right out of college. I was working in the automotive industry. I was very interested in doing the evolving, you know, finite element analysis, doing a lot of the computer aided engineering work. And because my girlfriend slash fiance at the time, uh, her field of biomedical engineering didn't offer her many uh, opportunities in the Detroit area. I migrated to the uh, Rochester area and eventually was uh, offered a position from a friend who uh, hooked me up with uh, one of his friends at L3 Harris and basically lured me to uh, the aerospace industry with all the cool computer aided engineering stuff that I liked that brought me to the automotive industry they basically brought me to the aerospace industry and said, yeah, I can use all those and take it to the next level. And that's exactly what happened. It was, it was, uh, it's been very cool. My one piece of advice to anybody that wants to go into the, you know, aerospace industry, uh, don't limit yourself. Uh, if you're going to college, don't limit yourself to only an aerospace engineering degree. Uh, there are numerous different types of engineers and or other, uh, you know, you know, skill sets that would go into uh, working in this uh, in this industry. You know, you can be an aerospace engineer, you can be a mechanical engineer, you can be an electrical engineer, you can be a, an optical engineer. Um, and then, you know, as we highlighted, there's all the other things that go along with it, you know. Being a very skilled assembly tech, uh, you know, having that hands-on work, you know, you're doing you're doing fine increment, like more precise than in you know working on the uh, most expensive watches or clocks that you could ever think of. Only you know, this mechanism is not the size of a watch or a clock; it's the size of you know a tennis court. So. Very cool field to be in. Definitely. Yeah, well, this is such an exciting project. I know in the chat it was mentioned that um, the Webb Telescope is hoping to be operational for at least 15 years, um, just you know, gathering data and photos and advancing what we know about science. And I know that L3 Harris is continuing to be on the cutting edge of, of what's next. So I think Tony has a slide um, about a project they're currently working on. Yeah, I just wanted that was a, you know, how to get into aerospace. Well, one way to get into aerospace is you can go to l3harris.com and apply for a job. Um, we have many openings, we are hiring, and uh, we are currently building the next telescope for NASA uh, called the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. Uh, you can go on our, our website there and see a cool video on what this telescope is about. Uh, this is smaller than the web, so we can build it right here in Rochester. And, uh, you know, conceivably you could apply today and a month from now be helping us uh, build this telescope. We'll be building this telescope for a couple more years. All right, awesome. So I just want to remind everybody that the launch itself is scheduled for Wednesday, December 22nd at 7.20 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, and it will be live streamed on NASA's website um, and also on the NASA TV channel. Um, so you can check those out um, and watch it launch. Um, of course, we know it's gonna take a while to unfold and cool down before we start seeing images. Um, and I just wanna make sure that we thank our three panelists, Tony, Scott, and Conrad. I know Conrad and Scott were hopping in and answering a lot of questions in the chat, which was really helpful. 
Um, and I also want to thank Irene Lockwood from L3 Harris. She's been instrumental in organizing this panel um, and helping helping make the connections that we needed to make um, so that this this program could happen. Um, and as well as anybody else on this call who contributed to web through through various companies. Um, so thank you for everybody for attending. I hope that you learned something new and exciting um, about web and space exploration and where aerospace is headed next. So as I mentioned before, you'll all be receiving a, sh a short survey um, about the event, and I would really appreciate your feedback um, to help the library and NASA plan more events like this in the future. Um, and if you'd like one of those commemorative items, you can email me um, or put that in your survey. Um, and Tony will also be doing another program um, that is part of these community events um, that NASA is helping sponsor. So if you would like to learn some more, even, even more in depth, Tony will be doing um, a talk about web at the Rochester Museum and Science Center on Wednesday, December 15th at 7.30 p.m. Um, that event will be in person and it does require pre-registration and a $15 per person fee. So you can find more information about that um, on their website. So thank you all for joining us. Um, and I hope that you learned a lot. Thanks everyone for this opportunity. It was fun. I hope it was fun for you.